I'm Alex Hirsch, creator of Gravity Falls. And I'm Matt Chapman, the voice of the Hand Witch. And uh, also uh, one of the writers on this episode. That's true. That's true, too. <laughs> um, so, little gift shop of horrors. Um, we, every season, we reach a point where we are a little behind. <laughs> and we have a bunch of ideas that we couldn't figure out how to put into the show. And we say, hey, can we just do a bunch of little mini episodes and give ourselves a stress break? Um, so these are mostly, these are, I'd say, just kind of more chill and fun to write and just easy than the other episodes. Is that your memory, Matt? Oh, absolutely, because there's just no stakes. Like, it's just <laughs> the fun of, it's like, the reason why that, like, idea went beyond just one sentence at all is because it was just like, oh, look, so many gags, so many fun ideas yeah. for that. There's no story or character real thing here, but wouldn't it be cool to see this? And in this case, it's like, great, we just, we can do that. There's no, like, no one's going to judge us because we set it up by, we set the whole show up with a gag. Yeah. Um, I remember that this, this episode was originally entitled uh, Tales to Sell My Merchandise. Um, and it, I think at the last second we had to change the title. You've come to the Mystery Shack after hours. A time when only our creepiest and most cursed objects are for sale. Like that thing there. <gasps> Robert Ryan Corey, one of our artists, when we had horrifying monsters, he designed that. Um, oh, it's so no good. revisions, I just said. Yep, done, approved. Good job. <laughs> that one's good. Um, so this was partially inspired by, uh, was it Friday the 13th, the television show? Was that the show uh, where there's like a, a shop of spooky, uh, spooky horrors? Yeah, um, I think it's like an anthology thing. Anthology. And the paw and all that. Yeah. Um, Andy Gonzalez got to give props. He does our title cards. Did a great Saul Bass there. Um, so where did I, my recollection of the Handwich story was that I had always had this. I, I had like a list of images in my mind that I always wanted to see in the series, and one of them was the kids fighting a hundred disembodied hands. It just I think I really liked the the Adams family hand, and it just seemed something specific. So um, I kind of asked guys figure something out and. Uh, I give Matt a lot of credit for figuring the story out. <laughs> well, no, I remember it was also Alonzo. We did the, like, Writer's Summit before season two, and uh, Alonzo came in, and he drew he drew the hand witch on her throne, remember? And so it was a throne made of hands. And he was like, yes. oh, I was thinking this could be the hand witch. You said you want to do a thing with a bunch of hands. And we were just like, yes, we got to do something with the hand witch. Yeah, that was an um, amazing drawing. And I, I do remember there was some drawing that somebody had done of her riding a giant hand like a carriage, like its fingers were <laughs> horses um that's right I, we weren't able to fit it into the episode we couldn't find a place for it but i it was such all that imagery with the hands was so good we had to think of a way to do it um and it seemed like a natural fit uh we need a little lesson all right stan and stealing writes itself we got a wet blanket for sale <laughs> i can't survive in this market <laughs> curse yeah right <laughs> Wait, is this curse ugly or normal ugly? <laughs> Looks like I got off scot-free. Oh. Ah! All right, kiddos, breakfast time. Prepare your mouth. Stan could weirdly get away with a lot by virtue of clearly not being a role model. There's no <laughs> suggestion that we're ever saying anyone should be anything like him. So, like, that, be, we, like and we, we come out of the gate with that. Like, in the second episode of the series, he's blindfolding the kids, driving through walls, getting arrested, <laughs> and harassing children. So, like, at this point, yeah, it's fine to have him shoplift from a witch. Um, th there, were a lot of, there were a lot of different story ideas. With, with an episode like this, I just basically go in the writer's room, and I, I mention a few things that I'd like to see, but it's also just like, let's just... What are cool things? What are just things that are simple and small visuals that we don't have room for in other episodes? Um, and sometimes they don't make it through. I remember, um, Matt, you and Shion had worked on a version of a story about Wendy getting a tattoo. That's right, yeah, and the tattoo became, like, uh, or maybe in, at one point did she become the tattoo? Like, it's so funny. I remember watching Moana and being like, wait, did they steal a night <laughs> part of this for, from our episode? <laughs> well, all of these uh, tended to come from one little gag or image, and, like, I love the idea of the fines fighting a million hands. Um, I got to pause. This is a Matt Chapman joke. Uh, that's, that's your voice. That's your joke. That's so funny. That game we always play. I never would have thought of a joke like that. It's so weird and specific. It always Every makes time me laugh. Stan comes in, they do the egg thing. <laughs> oh, we always have that. Me and Jimmy. Toss me a dozen <laughs> eggs. Um, 
But uh, yeah, we you, we used to have this story where it was I had this I, I thought it would be cool to do a tattoo living tattoo episode. And Wendy's a rebellious yeah. teen, so what if Wendy gets a tattoo and it comes to life and she learns a lesson about tattoos? And um, Matt and one of our writers, Shion, had done a first pass on it, and great gags as usual. Um, but there was something about Wendy's really hard to write for, um, like making her feel normally when we see her, she's so kind of cool and in control and. It was just really hard finding, for something so short, finding the depth to make it feel valuable. Um, yeah. So when you can't go deep enough, go double shallow. <laughs> it's, it's like we couldn't crack it, so let's just do this wacky hand adventure because at least we know the la- the jokes are going to land, right? Yeah, exactly. Well, and then it was great, too, because I feel like in, like, riffing on this episode, all these, like, hand puns came up, and then that's where, like, at the end when Mabel does her makeover, like, all of those come out. Is that a little uh, Game of Thrones nod with that? Uh, yeah, the, the our prop hand? designer, uh, our, our 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 prop designer made it a. Ga- oh no, I think it was actually Sabrina uh, who storyboarded this. She made I think a Game of Game of Thrones kind of hand in her storyboard, and our um our character designer gave her the Manos Hands of Fate reference design <laughs> yeah, on her shirt. That's a fantastic reference. Um, and also gave her hands for feet. If you look closely, <laughs> she has feet, hand feet, which is super gross. Um, yeah, she's kind of a Miyazaki-esque sort of character. And if her if her head was three times wider, <laughs> I feel like she would totally belong in one of those movies. <laughs> your your read on this with the I was just trying to get something going always makes me laugh. Oh, thank you. I, I felt like we did. We brought her. We brought a little humanity to the end, which was just that one line. It's, it's sort like, of <laughs> she's sort of the ugly one from Teen Girl Squad. Just like after years of not getting a date vocally. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so I remember it was Shion Takeuchi who also wrote uh, this uh, this this sketch uh, sketch. Anyways, she came up with the idea that just like, what if at one point it just turns into one of those like makeover shows or like a home makeover show, <laughs> and we were just like, yes, and like the rest of the episode just wrote, wrote itself. It was fantastic. That's that's one of those things where I remember reading that joke and I was like. This is actually really outside of how we normally structure our stories. Like, you do your little arc, and then it's over. And in this one, we do our little arc, and then we just have this extra <laughs> crazy thing at the end. But, like, it made me laugh so hard. I was, like, I was actually really excited to see something that broke our usual format. Like, you just don't expect it to just keep riffing <laughs> like this. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh, right! Shaky! Scratchy! I've missed you, old rascals. You're all right, sister. Will you be my boyfriend now? Nope, never. Well, I learned nothing. Uh, Back to my crippling loneliness. Hey, I'm lost in these mountains. Could I crash here for the night? Please, come in. Uh, Um, Matt also voices this mountaineer, is that right? Yeah, I think I'm the mountain climber, too. Wow, thanks for noticing. <laughs> so that's Matt has an incredible vocal range. You don't want the hand. You're a savvy um, and actually, Matt does a lot of our voices and is super, super accomplished voice actor. Like, when we were in a pinch, he always knocked it out of the park. And we had him audition for a lot of characters. Actually, he came really close to being Grunkle Stan and probably would have been better. Like, the only reason I didn't Shush. cast Matt as Grunkle Stan, his audition was phenomenal. And I'm such a huge fan of Matt's and a huge fan of Strong Bad and Homestar Runner. And I worried that he sounded too much like Strong Bad. Um, and that, and he, yeah, it was hard to escape. He was, he was in there, especially when he'd get like angry. It was, <laughs> it was pretty much the same voice. In retrospect, I think I was being overly concerned because it's like Seth MacFarlane just did the same voice as the teddy bear in Ted. Like, I'm a bear now. <laughs> and like, nobody had a problem with it. I was like, oh, audiences are a lot more forgiving of using the same voice. Like we probably could have done it. Um, but, uh, no, like, dude, the show would be it'd be a different show if you weren't the voice. I I, I, I appreciate my my little corner of the Gravity Falls universe that I got to give. Uh, give me a give, little, give me a little Chapman Grunkle Stan. What would that sounded like? Uh, I just remember doing the uh, doing the read for it was like the sides from your auditions from before you know the show uh-huh. uh, was being made or whatever, and it was something about kids. Uh, I can't find my pants or something, and so it's just like kids. I can't find my pants. <laughs> Uh, it's good, or man. Where are my pants? Or I don't it's remember what it was. It's a good stand. You're, you're what I could have been. There, but for the grace of God, goes I. <laughs> um, th- this episode, uh, this came from 
I did a sketch on a napkin while I was having breakfast with my girlfriend of Waddles. <laughs> of Waddles <laughs> in a little homemade machine if he got smart. And it, la- it, it cracked me up so much, I was like, all right, we got to figure this story out. Um, it proved really difficult to write just because it's such a big idea and we only have seven minutes. Um, the fact yeah, that we like got to have him have this whole transformation and like, yeah, he, like it's basically like the plot of something like, you know, an E.T. type of movie. But you got to cram it into this tiny sketch. Yes. Um, I got to give Matt credit. A Baconings. That's your title. I was knocked yep. out by that pun. So good. Oh, was that me? Oh, I didn't even remember. I absolutely well, remember. I got I'll a good it. memory I'll for puns. <laughs> um, so obviously. Who, didn't you have there were some alt. uh did uh, Jad Abumrad come in and do the voice at some point? Like, weren't there a couple of alts for the yes. voice of Waddles? Um, so we knew we wanted Waddles to be voiced by some prominent thinker. Um, I had originally wanted to get uh, Jad Abumrad, uh, producer on uh, the podcast Radio Lab, which I love. Phenomenal podcast. And it was such a joy that he came in and, and he did the voice. Um, and when we actually sat down and listened to it, he did a good performance, but the lines were written to have this ponderous bombast and he has this really kind of sweet endearing kind of voice and it felt like oh it's it's the wrong joke like he's great but it's the wrong joke we need somebody with like kind of a like a deeper more thoughtful register um and it was it, it was so hard for me to tell him like oh you were great but i think we need to go with somebody else and uh you know we ended up i i was like i was like ah shoot for the moon i guess let's try neil degrasse tyson i and um you know the casting department came back saying He's Neil deGrasse Tyson passed. He's never going to do this. And then I sent it again. Can we ask him again? And then I sent him again. And then, like, it wasn't until, like, the animation came back. Like, four months later, I was like, well, let's try him one more time. And he finally <laughs> said yes. And I couldn't <laughs> I believe that. it. You had to ask him four times. Yeah, I think we asked. I asked prob- at least three, maybe four times over the course of months. And finally, I don't know why. He just, he was fine with it. And he he came in and he was amazing he was so (laughs) kind and thoughtful and it was so bizarre to be voice directing this genius astrophysicist who's chilled (laughs) with carl sagan and stephen hawking and um i I didn't know what he was gonna think of the script and i remember he read it and he was like i have a concern and i was like mr tyson (laughs) hit me with what you got you know this thing is so absurd it could be anything right and he was like well, on page three, we describe it as a uh, mind-altering serum, but on page five, it's a mind-altering potion. Potions and serums, of course, not the same. And I was like, well, Neil, you know what? Whatever you want. You want serum? I like the sound of serum. It's serum now. Um, do you have any issue with the Smarticle accelerator? No, that's funny. It feeds him potatoes. Like, <laughs> You can't predict what is going to trigger his, like, you know, uh, like fix it, nerd brain. Um, right, right. When, when we realized that we were getting him, I added a number of lines that were intentionally absurd, kind of si- like as a dare, like, is he actually going to read this? Like I added the line, yummy, yummy for my fat little pig tummy, like an hour before the record, like, he's not going to say that. He's not going to say it. And he was so good. He had such a sense of humor. He loved it. He loved doing this character. And he like, he laughed at some of our dialogue, which is like, you know, when you're writing a goofy kids cartoon show and one of the smartest public thinkers of our time laughs at your dumb puns, Smarticle, that's good. <laughs> like, <laughs> that was a very What's rewarding the other part? feeling. Something about like maybe there's more to life than fart jokes, Mabel. Like Mabel, that there's more to life out, than fart uh, jokes and laughing at those fart jokes. <laughs> um, while I had him in for a minute, I was like, oh my gosh, I, I've got this smart guy. I could ask him anything. I, I was trying to think of something to ask him. I actually, I did ask him a question. I asked him... I had read a Carl Sagan book saying that uh, humans were the only animal that experienced the pain of childbirth. Um, and people think it's because of the Neolithic revolution when we discovered agriculture, our brains grew super fast in a short amount of time and they be- our skulls got too big for the birthing canal. And I asked him like, is that, is that true? And he's like, nope, also horses. Horses are smart. <laughs> <laughs> that was the one piece of knowledge I got from like I could be asking him anything he's like an astrophysicist it was the first thing that popped into my head no, that's a pretty good one I, I, don't, I couldn't come up with anything close to that I would just ask him something about like you know the moon, well, the moon I think, and green cheese <laughs> I think his theory was humans developed head brains that were bigger because of the Neolithic revolution and horses brains got bigger because of their experience with humans it's like we created ah. agriculture our heads got too big we domesticated horses their heads got too big and we're the two animals where it physically hurts to be born because 
why would natural selection choose for the ultimate end goal of its process to be insanely painful? It makes no <laughs> sense, right? <laughs> right. Um, an another thing about Neil deGrasse Tyson was somehow, I remember at one point he said, well, that's fine. This is like cartoon logic. And I was like, oh, yeah. Like how um, when Wile E. Coyote runs off a cliff and he doesn't fall until he looks down. And he said, precisely. <laughs> <laughs> and it was like the best day of my life. Um, Clay Day. Uh, I, I remember like this was a uh, the, like stop motion episode was like up on the board. From, yes. Like, you know, the first day that I was involved in the show for sure was like always a, like, how do we make it work? We, we always want to do stop motion. I'm a big Harry Housen fan. Um, and we it's one of these ideas where we couldn't justify a whole episode for it. But like, man, we wanted to work with a stop motion team. Um, and that, this was the perfect opportunity. We, we reached out to the animators at Stupid Buddies, who are so good. Um, and uh, I remember the, they sent us back their quote, and the channel said, too expensive, can't do it. So I asked them, <laughs> how much does it cost per frame for stop motion animation? And I literally counted the frames in this episode of, of stop motion and did the math and spent a night breaking it down so that we could afford to do this because I just wow, couldn't pass up a chance remember that. to work with them. Yeah, no, it happened after the animatic. They were like, you need to cut a minute's worth of animation. So all these things where we see the same shot or there's just one loop of skeletons and we're copying and pasting it. That was all ways to save money. I can work within time and budget if I'm forced. Doesn't Seuss make a joke about how uh, all this expensive stuff is happening <laughs> off screen? Yes. Um, this, this idea that Mabel's scared of stop motion, do you remember where that came from? I, I don't. I feel like it was sort of, it was something that got baked in early on and we had to keep it. Like, it was <laughs> like, a, it was like, well, we can't, that's that, that worked for a minute. And now we have, everything else has to be shaped around that now. Right. Uh, I think it was just like a, it, would, it was sort of a fun surprise because it seems like she should love it. But like, there's something about like, you know, the like. I don't know. I, I was terrified of mannequins when yeah, I was a kid, but yeah. I like I loved puppets. I loved Muppets. I loved all these other things, but just mannequins. There was something about mannequins that was just off and like soulless to me. It's stop motion has that. It can be very very creepy. Yeah. Have you, have you seen the Will Vinton Mark Twain adventures? That old stop motion movie. Oh yeah, yeah. Of terrifying. Course. Utterly terrifying. <laughs> <laughs> it's slowly swiping at us. Let's escape by this the, getting stop motion and 2D to look plausibly like they're connecting very very difficult. Um, you know, planning the red light there and then the red rim light on those skeletons. When you watch it, it just seems natural. But so much communication between so many people necessary to just make that kind of plausible. And then lots of cheats like this, like us cutting the shadows so we can save on animation. Um, those two skeletons in the background, you'll notice they have this idling loop um, that we slightly offset. So we only paid to animate one and then just copied and pasted them. So nice. we really had to think like classic animation producers. Yeah, exactly. That's what's great. You were like cutting the corners the same way that Harryhausen <laughs> yeah. probably had to. You really someone... um, That's what was cool too. Is that I, 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 when you say that it's like, you know, oh, we're gonna do Harryhausen, then it's like I never know what, when you go to animators. Is it like, is that like too obvious of a thing? You know, where it's just like, oh, of course you want it to look like Harryhausen. But uh, they like loved it, and it, like it was like, no, no, no. That's what you want to ask an animator to emulate. Matt, you <laughs> created, like, yes. you created that guy eating the cookie, right? The CG cookie man. That's another one of the honors of uh, working on the show. Yes, uh, making bad. I got to do two instances of bad CG on Gravity Falls between the part where Gideon and uh, Ghost Eyes turn into CG Dire Straits video guys and that 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 Cookie Man. Uh, yeah, Matt's I love a, me some bad CG, Alex. Matt's a full Renaissance man. He does voices. He writes. He could do CG. He could sing songs. Like it's it's such a pleasure working with somebody like that who just can constantly add cool stuff to the episode. I, I can only scream and write, and there's literally nothing else. So I'm always so inspired. <laughs> oh, that was the best when you would come into my office and like, you know, I always, you know, would want to get any writing assignment or anything, but the times when you'd come in and be like, Chapman, I need you to make a song. Or like, Chapman, <laughs> I need you to like, you know, come up with some other thing. Can you shoot some video? Like there was always, it was great. You gave me such awesome missions. Like as a writer on that show, I got to wear about 15 different hats that had nothing to do with writing. <laughs> Oh, and very, very few people could do that. That line, wipe that face off your face, classic Matt Chapman line. Brilliant. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> oh, yeah. Did I get to do, do I get to be that starfish thing? I can't remember. Is that you? I think it's, I think it's me pitched down, maybe? I think it might be. Um, the, uh, 
<laughs> uh, those legs, those fat legs always crack me up. The, um, the team that did this, I had told them, stupid buddies, they're such good animators, and I had told them, um, guys, like, this is a parody of stop motion. So I want you to add thumbprints and make it janky and make it like a caricature. And they didn't. They just made it amazing instead. And <laughs> I was like, you know what? I'll take it. Um, this is another thing where we wanted a big battle, couldn't afford it. So we just hung a lampshade on it. Uh, John DiMaggio <laughs> is the voice of uh, uh, the Harryhausen character. He did a great job. This end bit almost got cut for time, but I was just like, guys, we cannot do this episode without a Gumby reference. We need to put it in there. <laughs> I can do most anything. Whoa. I can walk through walls. Originally, Stan shot him with a shotgun. Uh, <laughs> That's right. <laughs> they changed it. <laughs> That's pretty good, too, though. It's still pretty good. We're safe now. You don't want the pig. You don't want my tapes. What are you going to buy? How about this delicious potion? Here, have a free sample. You should have bought my merch when you had the chance, buddy. But that's okay. I'll have something new for sale very soon. <laughs> Um, so the, one of the hardest things about an episode like this is, you know, much like Bottomless Pit, there is no overarching story. And at the end of the episode, you might kind of feel like, yeah, sure, I had some laughs, but am I satisfied? So we need something crazy to happen. Um, so this idea that Grunkle Stan poisons the audience and then traps you inside his shack felt suitably Halloween-y. Hey, I wanted to be exes. Let me be exes. Trust me, just let her be exes. <sighs> yeah! Actually, I'm sorry, I changed my mind. I'll be O's. Okay, you're gonna hate me right now, but is X is still a possibility? I don't think you're playing this right. 